Okay. Well, thanks everybody for logging on. And um, we have another really interesting talk today. Uh, very happy to welcome Dr. Veli Tokara from uh, Columbia uh, to join us today. Uh, he's gonna talk about a paper that was recently, that he was recently the senior author on that was published in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation. Uh, talking about something I think we, you know, in our group and probably most groups across the country um, think about or, or run into uh, with our patients uh, in, in regard to how are we going to use, you know, LVADs to, uh, to bridge folks from advanced heart failure to possibly becoming a, a transplant recipient? And how is that different now, given the new uh, changes to the allocation system? So I'm really excited to hear what he has to tell us, because I think it's going to be very relevant to the things we do for our, our patients. And I'm really happy that he, uh, Dr. Tokar has taken the time today to join us. So Thank you so much, and, and please, uh, Dr. Tokara, please uh, go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Michael, for the kind invitation, and it's really a um, great pleasure uh, to be with you today uh, discussing our recent paper at the JHLP. So, okay. Um, so I will start off talking about um, the new heart allocation system, um, and briefly touch on the recent changes in the durable device landscape. Um, then I will start discussing um, our recent publication, looking at the heart meat tree version in the new allocation system. And I will finish off talking a little bit about cardiac recovery and implications of the new allocation system in um, cardiac recovery. <clears throat> and as many of you know, the old allocation system had uh, three urgency status tiers, 1A, 1B, and 2. And specifically for elder patients, um, after they are implanted, they would be listed as a status 1B. Um, and you could pick up 30 days to upgrade them for status 1A. Um, and uh, they would drop down to 1B. And then essentially we would wait until they develop a VET complication and they, they would go up to status 1A and then get transplanted from there. But the problem with the old system was that it didn't really account for differences in mortality within the 1A group. For example, um, a patient in the unit on ECMO support, a patient who is intubated um, in the unit, they had to wait for the same time compared to a patient who is walking around, stable at home, maybe you know with a uh, albed driveline infection. And that certainly this, you know, not being able to separate those patients contributed to the increased uh, rate risk mortality. And as a result, um, patients were getting sicker before a heart could become available. And an increasing number of patients getting, were getting implanted with durable adverts to the point that uh, before changing to the new allocation system, almost 50% of patients already had a durable LVAD in place at the time of heart transplantation. And not only more patients had LVAD implants, but uh, patients also had to stay on LVAD for longer to be able to get to the heart transplant. And this also created another problem because the transplant operation becomes way more complicated if you have to explant the LVAD. And these patients are also sicker. And, uh, Doing the transplant of all patients who have been on prolonged LVAD support also are at risk for developing primary graft failure and vasoplegia. And many programs across the country started seeing increasing uh, TGF incidence after, after a heart transplant because of the struggling population of LVAD patients. Another major limitation of the old system was the fact that the donor heart uh, would first go to a local stable 1B, as opposed to going to a sicker 1A that could still be in the uh, zone A. Um, and I think that also resulted in um, high weight risk mortality in the old allocation system. So the <clears throat> new heart allocation system was really developed to address some of these um, shortcomings of the old system. And the new system has six status tiers. Um, and patients with the temporary support devices, such as ECMO, balloon pump, or Impella, are deemed to be at higher risk. And as such, they are prioritized as status one or status two. And on the other hand, patients on the durable device support are deemed to be more stable. 
and uh, and they are prioritized as status four if they have no device complication, um, and they are typically upgraded to status three in most cases if they have a device related complication. And another improvement of the new part allocation system was the broader geographic sharing. And now uh, the donor part goes to the sickest patient in the zone A as opposed to going to a more stable 1B patient. Um, and I think that really helps uh, getting hearts to these uh, patients who are in the most need quicker. And Right after the implementation of the uh, new allocation system, I think one of the earliest impact of the new system was that um, the significant increase in the utilization of temporary support devices, such as ECMO, Impella, Balloon Pump. And the numbers are almost tripled right after the implementation of the new policy. So a significant increase in the utilization of the temporary support devices with the new allocation system, as many investigators have shown. The most popular um, pathway for transplant is status two pathway, and almost half of patients in the United States uh, bridge the transplant using uh, status two pathway. And there are three different options that you could be listed for status two uh, with one of these devices. Uh, first one is the hemodynamic criteria, which is a systolic pressure less than 90, cardiac index less than 1.8 or wage greater than 15 and having all of these three factors. Um, there's a non-hemodynamic criteria, which is one of the four, uh, having a CPR, elevated lactate, elevated transaminases, or uh, profound hypertension with systolic less than 70. Or there's a third option. You can implant one of these pumps and you can apply for an exception status and try to make the case for the patient. And when we looked at the outcomes of status two version with temporary support, the greatest outcomes are excellent. 80% of patients who were upgraded to status two with either balloon or impella were transplanted by thirty days. And the risk of death or delisting for worsening status was only around 3%. Now, interestingly, only a small portion of patients were um, uh, use the non-hemodynamic criteria indication, and those patients had worse outcomes compared to patients who were using hemodynamic criteria. And interestingly, those numbers, the hemodynamic numbers that we use to justify status to upgrade, uh, those numbers have no impact on weightless outcomes of transplant or mortality. So in other words, if you had a patient that had a veg of 30 versus 15 or 16, uh, their risk of greatest mortality was not different. And same applies for cardiac index or systolic blood pressure. And this was a great paper um, from um, Yale by Dr. Mullen and Dr. Um, Ahmed, uh, which was essentially the first one uh, to show that while the use of temporary devices had been significantly increasing. Uh, there was a dramatic decline in the use of durable devices for you know, bridging to transplantation. And this may not come as surprising because as we discussed now with the new allocation, the durable device patients are prioritized lower, uh, typically as status four or four status three, as opposed to the temporary support patients which are higher status as one or two. But another um, uh, problem for the other patients is that they don't get to use the exception status as often. And only 13% of LVET patients, patients listed for transplant with a durable LVET, ends up using exception status during their listing time. And that's in comparison to, for example, 33% of pollen pump patients or 25% of ECMO patients. So the LVET patients. Uh, don't uh, utilize the exception pathway as opposed to other patient groups. And one of the reasons for this is that the ALVET complications are very well outlined in detail uh, for the status upgrade. And as such, I don't think there's much bigger room left. Um, and most of the complications are well covered in the status two, three um, complication um, um, 
complication indication. And uh, it's really difficult to come up with a reason that that, that was not present in these um, upgrade forms. And aside from the changes in the allocation system, there has also been significant changes in the uh, durable device landscape. Most notably, as you know, is the uh, momentum three trial, which showed um, superior outcomes for patients who are implanted with HeartMate three LDAD, centrifugal flow LDAD, as opposed to HeartMate two. And uh, and essentially, at this point, HeartMate two is uh, practically no longer in uh, clinical use. And this is an old data slide from the endurance trial, which was a two-to-one enrollment destination therapy trial for HVAC patients. And one of the notable findings of this early trial was that the stroke incidence was significantly higher for the HVAC patients versus uh, control patients. And if you look at it, numerically, stroke rate or stroke proportion almost tripled in number. And our institutional data, uh, even although it was a small number of patients, was very similar to these figures. And <clears throat> as a result, in uh, June 2021, the FDA stopped uh, new implantations of HVAC pump, um, and this device is essentially no longer uh, available for use. And essentially, at this point, because of these recent changes, HeartMate3 is really the only pump at this point, only the durable device that we can use to bridge patients for heart transplantation. And Dr. Matan Uriel, which is a superstar medicine resident at Columbia, um, he decided to look at outcomes of patients who uh, were essentially bridging to transplant with HeartMate 3 in the old versus new allocation system and look at their outcomes. So first thing Matan did was to try to look at the trends of utilization of all FDA approved uh, durable bridge devices. Uh, focusing on the three main devices, which are HeartMate 2, HeartMate 3, and HVAC. And uh, aside from the regular coding, we ended up going into the um, device brands that were coded as other in order to pick up uh, patients who essentially ended up having text coding, because we find quite a bit of uh, patients who were coded as other, um, but were text coded as HeartMate 2, HeartMate 3 or HVAC. So we were able to retrieve all that data uh, to accurately estimate the number of patients. And at the end, what we found was that there was um, a 35% decrease in the number of um, HeartMate 3 implants from the peak year uh, 2016 to the um, 2020. And the other thing we found was that if you look at the different device types, by 2020, HeartMate 3 was the main device, uh, the most commonly utilized device, both for listing and uh, also at the time of transplant, which is shown in the blue bars. Um, we then looked at the baseline characteristics and uh, heart made three patients who were bridging to transplant in the new allocation system um, were less likely to have an ICD in place at the time of listing. Uh, they were less likely to be blood type O um, heart made three patients in the uh, transplanted in the new allocation system also had lower pulmonary artery pressures, although these um, differences may not be clinically significant. Uh, we also found that uh, heart kidney dual transplant was more common uh, after heart made three in the new allocation system uh, in the 5.4% versus 1.7%. And also use of Pepsi positive donors. Uh, more common in the new allocation system, and ischemic time was also prolonged by half an hour in the heart made three British patients in the new allocation system. Uh, we then looked at the UNOS you know, status at the time of transplant in the heart made three patients in the new allocation system, and the most common status that was used was status three in 276 patients. But interestingly, if you look with a uh, within the status three, um, almost 75% of them were using 30 day discretionary time, and only a small portion had device complications, uh, with the most common one being device related infection. And following status three, um, 214 patients were transplanted as uh, stable status four. 
Um, and status one was only in 27 patients, and status two was only in 75 patients. And the indications for status one or two were either arrhythmia, uh, device malfunction, and half of these patients actually were upgraded using the exception pathway. In terms of the transplant weightless outcomes um, of uh, heartmate three patients listed in the old allocation shown in red here and the new allocation shown in blue. Um, as you see in the panel A, there was really no difference in terms of uh, transplant weightless outcomes, such as heart transplantation or risk of mortality or delisting for worsening status. Um, and overall, the chances of transplant after being listed with heartmate 3 was around 50%. And the risk of death after being listed with heartmate 3 was around 4 to 5% at one year follow-up. But in panel B, when we looked at the uh, post-transplant survival, what we found was that patients bridging to transplant with HotMate 3 had um, significantly lower survival at one year follow-up in the new allocation system, uh, which was 87.3%, and that compared to 93.6% in the old allocation system. And one thing that was concerning in this analysis, as you can appreciate on the blue line, is the number of patients with uh, that are censored, uh, essentially HEP does not have enough follow-up, which is concerning for um, informative censoring bias. So we repeated this analysis by restricting uh, the new allocation patients through the end of 2019, as opposed to end of 2020. Um, we also have applied other methods. We included and excluded crossover patients. And we also applied um, administ administrative censoring at 365 days. Um, but in all these different methods, um, uh, the heart made three implants in the new allocation system still did poorly at the post transplant compared to the heart made trees that were bridged in the old allocation system. We then did a multivariate analysis to try to understand the clinical risk factors that may predict um, post transplant mortality in patients bridging with heart rate 3. And the factors that turned out to be significant were old age, um, obesity with a BMI greater than 33, um, ischemic etiology of heart failure, poor functional status, and PVR greater than 3. Um, elevated creatinine was also borderline significant with a p-value of 0 0.053. And interesting enough, even after adjusting for these factors that we identified, in uh, bridging in the new heart allocation system still remained a significant predictor of uh, increased post-transplant mortality. And then by using these um, six clinical predictors, we derived a simple clinical risk score, which we named HotMate 3 Bridge Risk Score, um, and every risk factor counted as one. And what we found was that 11% of patients um, had a bridging risk score that was four or greater. And as you see in panel B in red, these patients with a score of four or greater had significantly higher risk of early post-transplant mortality uh, which was around 25% of one. Um, we also looked at individual risk scores, and what we found is that with every successive increase in um, heart rate three risk score, there was incremental risk for post transplant mortality. And patients within um, score of five group, which were only 17 patients, had close to 50% mortality within one year. The study had obviously a number of limitations. Uh, this is a retrospective registry analysis. I think most importantly, you know, database doesn't really have much data in terms of, you know, advex specific information. What was the pump settings? Were patients hemodynamically optimized? How is their right ventricle is doing? You know, none of this information is available in the UNOS. Um, we also did not have a validation cohort. We didn't do any internal validation or external validation, um, essentially because we have a very small number of patients to work with. And of course, the findings may not be applicable to other international uh, transplant programs. This, these findings are really specific to the, you know, stock allocation system. 
So in conclusion, we um, found that the utilization of global devices has declined in the new power allocation system um, around 35% decline at the time of transplant. The weightless outcomes of the listing with HeartMate 3 was comparable in the old versus new allocation system, again with 50% chances of transplant at one year after listing and 5% risk of mortality. Uh, but the post-transplant early mortality was increased in HeartMate 3 patients verging in the new allocation system. Um, of course, we need to take this result with caution because of still um, informative bias that, that might be going on. And we also identified the risk factors that were um, associated with increased post-transplant mortality in patients verging with HeartMate 3. Um, and this slide shows our bridging strategy at Columbia in the new heart allocation system. Um, this year, so far, we have done 72 hearts, heart transplants, and 16 of them were actually bridged with a durable device. So that's around 22%. So one in five patients still at Columbia is bridged to transplant with a durable device that, of course, have declined from the old allocation system which was more around 40 to 50%. And status two pathway is uh, the most common pathway. And around 39% of our patients this year were virtual transplant with a bubble pump at Columbia or in Pella. And you have probably seen this uh, recent publication from the Momentum 3 group, um, which showed a remarkable uh, five-year survival with HeartMate 3, uh, which is 58.4%. Um, and this includes not only bridge patients, but also destination therapy patients. Um, but when we look at the transplant outcomes um, during the same enrollment period of Momentum 3 trial, the transplant outcomes are around 80.2%. So great progress has been made, but of course there's still more work to do to um, to, to have a device that, that works as well as hard transplant. And uh, the, the other point that I want to make is that the new heart allocation system offers an accelerated pathway to transplant, and it's great. You can have a sick patient, you can list your patient with one of these temporary devices and get them to transplant quickly. But just because it's available, um, it may not be the right decision in every case. For example, think about this patient who is young, uh, non ischemic newly diagnosed, never really been on good medical therapy, but shows up very sick with cardiogenic shock, requiring an impeller or balloon, and you're unable to remove that uh, temporary support device. So should we urgently transplant this young patient, or should we consider you know, recovery pathway, maybe with a modified short-term device or even with a durable device? What's the right decision for this patient? And these are really, very, very difficult questions to answer. And interestingly, when we looked at uh, the new allocation system, the number of patients who were recovering and being removed from the transplant waitlist after being listed with a temporary support device has significantly declined in the new allocation system for both ECMO Centromac patients as well as balloon pump in Bella. ECMO bivet patients, the candidate recovery rate was around 8% in the old allocation system, and that dropped down to 1.5%. So where did these recovery patients go? So with the new allocation, even though the transplant rates are much improved and the mortality risk is significantly reduced, which is really great and amazing for these patients, but also the recovery rates have declined in the new allocation system. So could this be because we don't really have enough time to achieve any meaningful recovery? Um, and maybe a heart becomes available quickly and maybe we don't have the time to really have, you know, any, make any progress in some of these younger patients. But are we really doing them a favor, giving them a transplant at a very young age and in 10 years, they may need another heart and a kidney. Maybe we start to clock too early. Maybe we should be more aggressive about recovering these patients using you know, different pathways. But of course, the toughest thing is to figure out which patient would respond to LVAD and which patient would recover. And we try to address that with 
with machine learning. Um, and the machine learning tool picked up all the established risk factors for recovery that's been established in the literature, such as, you know, young age, non ischemic short duration, small or hard. Um, but interestingly, uh, it, it showed us that patients who were non compliant at the time of device implant had a non compliance history or who were drinking alcohol were more likely to recover, which is probably something that I would not look at with a, with a regression. Um, but they were associated with higher risk of recovery. Um, and the machine learning tool predicted recovery fairly well with an area under third grade closer to 0.8. Um, and one in every five patients that were predicted to recover by the machine learning tool in the validation cohort ended up being explanted from ADVAN in the internet registry. Um, and with that, I will stop. And these are some of the wonderful people uh, that I worked with at Columbia. I would like to highlight Matan, Dr. Matan Uriel, who really did a phenomenal job with the Hotnik T. Bridge paper. Got published in Journal of Health and Lung Transplant. Um, and Dr. Florkin has done the work with the status to bridging with Falun Pantan in Tala that was also published not too long ago. And thank you again for your invitation and happy to you know, answer any questions. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Tokara. That was uh, really wonderful. And thank you for going above and beyond and providing us with so much additional information. That's really, it's really interesting to hear about and uh, learn about from you. Um, any, anybody out there in the group want to ask uh, any questions? I'll keep my mouth closed for a moment and give you a chance. Well, as um, maybe the group's thinking of anything they might like to ask, I guess the one thing that struck me was, you know, there's sort of, I guess paradoxically, maybe a difference uh, of who you might expect to be um, receiving durable LVAD support now versus maybe uh, whom you we we might be thinking about putting on some type of temporary mechanical circulatory support, or, or maybe I'm misunderstanding uh, the data. But you know, when you were looking at those two groups of or the 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 group of people uh, who had durable LVAD going into transplant and showing that since the allocation system has changed, uh, it seems like they're a little bit sicker uh, than those that maybe uh, were going through that bridging process prior to the new allocation system. And, um, you know, we would always think that obviously we're trying to list the sicker patients higher. Uh, so you'd think that maybe the sicker patients would be the ones that would be having some uh, temporary mechanical circulatory support. Um, but I guess, what, what are your thoughts about that? Do you think that there's some type of I guess, um, and I think you, you, you did hint on it a, a bit, but some type of alternative motivation that might be uh, causing us to maybe not necessarily put the sicker patients uh, with the more aggressive therapies or uh, vice versa. Right, so you are you referring to the um, patients having adverse outcomes in the new allocation system following company and they could be Correct. possible? Um, you know, it's really hard. I think that was one part that I couldn't really, and we were really trying hard to understand why do patients all of a sudden experience, you know, 6% higher risk of one-year mortality in the new location. It's the same pump. It's almost the same patients. Of course, there are some differences. As we highlighted, you know, the hearts are more ischemic, right? Because of the world they're sharing, ischemic time is definitely prolonged because of increased travel. Um, you know, there is more hep C utilization, but so far the hep C data looks fairly strong in terms of outcomes, so that shouldn't explain it. Um, and in terms of uh, the risk, we really tried to adjust for anything that stood out in the UNOS database. Could there be anything outside the database that hasn't been addressed? Certainly possible. I mean, that those patients could be sicker, but 6% is really a significant difference. Um, and I, I remember the... Um, Yale paper, even though it didn't look at heart rate alone, it brought all the Google devices together, had the similar sort of difference in the survival. But but my suspicion is that the numbers are still small, mm -hmm. and we still don't have great follow-up. And I'm still worried about the informative censoring, because we did everything we could by limiting the follow-up time or censoring at one year. Uh, but 
I, I'm still worried about it. I think we still need longer follow-up, more patients, and then we're going to get the better answer about the post transplant survival. Um, in terms of, you know, did the temporary support devices impacted the type of patients who are having that place? The answer is probably yes. Yeah. Because I think nowadays, I think all of us, we try to put patients to transplant list whenever we can. Uh, because I think most of us would agree that the status two pathway is probably the, the easiest pathway. And patients don't have to go through an additional habit operation, which is a great thing for the patient if they can avoid that. Um, so as a result, I think we end up with an elevated population, which is actually much sicker than it used to be. It's almost like a destination therapy population who are uh, maybe older, more pulmonary hypertension, more psychosocial risk, um, you know, and these other risk factors. Um, and sometimes they can still become bridge eligible over time, uh, but those patients could be inherently sicker uh, than the ones in the old allocation system um, you know, in which, you know, most of those patients are BTP probably up front, but maybe the ones that we are seeing in the new allocation system was DT first and then ended up transitioning to BTT over time, but those patients could still be higher risk than others who were BTT up front. So I think, I think we'll, we'll have more data over time and have better answers, but that could certainly play a role. Anybody uh, in the group? Well, then uh, another question I was thinking about was, you know, there's, um, I wouldn't say great dissatisfaction, but there's, you know, some degree of concern uh, regarding this, the new allocation system in regards to, is it helping us truly achieve the best outcomes for the patients that need therapies the most? Or, you know, are we are we potentially, you know, doing harm or, or neglecting other groups of patients? And, you know, that's that's something I, I know that's been talked about in some different published essays and, and at conferences and things like, that, you know, of the like. I guess, what are your thoughts there? If you had, if based upon, you obviously looked at this through a number of different uh, methods and, and different papers, I guess if you were to uh, recommend maybe uh, uh, an area where if the allocation system was again went went through some form of a revision, uh, where do you think it most most often fails our our patients currently, and where we really need to try to try to improve things moving forward? Right, great question, Mike. And uh, I think overall the new allocation system was a great step forward. Um, so I think overall, it was, it's, it's really much better than what it used to be. Um, and I really like um, the ability of transplanting patients, sicker patients quickly without sending them to durable device. I think that's a great step forward. But like in any other system, there's always you know good things and there are some limitations and some of those we learn as we go. Uh, and the things that I would change, um, for example, you know, sending complicated adaptations of transplant surgery, right? Um, you know, and, and as opposed to like stable ones, uh, you know, that doesn't make too much sense. Maybe we should send stable patients who we know are good candidates for transplant. Maybe we should send those patients for transplant as opposed to waiting for a complication to happen. And then you try to transplant them at the time when they are much sicker. I mean, that doesn't necessarily always make sense. So. That part, I think, we need to think through. The other uh, problem, I think, is the hemodynamic criteria, which is actually, if you look at it, 90% of patients with balloon or impella get listed with hemodynamic criteria. And what is that based on? That's based on veg, blood pressure, and index. So three numbers. But in reality, most of those patients are actually not in classical cardiogenic shock. They don't have AKI, they don't have lactate, they don't have transaminases. So a lot of these patients could essentially be decompensated heart failure, but they are not in classical cardiogenic shock. So how do we, I mean, are we really doing the right thing by allowing these, you know, decompensated patients take that transplant route uh, and you know, put a, give them a balloon pump and transplant them quickly? Is that really the right approach? I think that has to be revised, and maybe we should look for 
end organ markers of end organ injury and 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 end organ hypoperfusion rather than using you know three simple numbers of hemodynamics, which could even be abnormal in a patient with class two heart failure. So I think that that's I think another area that has to improve. And the other thing is that I mean we can change the allocation system as many times as we want. But allocation system is really how you shuffle the cards. Uh, and now we are shuffling the cards better, but shuffling the cards doesn't fix the real problem, which is the number of the cards. We don't have enough number of cards. We need more mm. cards. There's so many people who need transplant. So I think that's the area that we need to work on, like BCD donors and being able to use them, FC donors. Really try to expand the donor pool because that's going to give us more cards. Because on the other side with allocation, all you are trying to do is trying to shuffle better, which I think is still very important. But I think we need to pay more attention to where do we get more cards. Yeah, wonderful point. Wonderful point. I, and I completely agree with that. Your your statement or, or your your point of view uh, that you started off there with. It seems like, you know, uh, the way the system is currently designed. You know, as we try to do the what's best for our patients because we want to do what's best for our patient that's in front of us. You know, there's these competing, um, there's a conflict there about, you know, do you do something to try to help them in one way, but also then it potentially carries, you know, some some innate risk as it is a more aggressive type of therapy. Um, on the other hand, it's, it's tough. It's very, t very tough. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear others uh, struggle with it as much as I do. So, um, you know. uh, any, any other thoughts out there from the group? Okay, well, hi, my name yep. is Samir. I'm a fellow from Danbury. Sorry, uh, just a quick question. I'm sorry, this is a kind of a naive question, but it just sort of something I was thinking about, and you kind of touched on it um, when you talked about sort of you know the number of people that need transplant. With the new allocation system, does it put you know is this less sustainable in terms of just demand of patients that will you know that would need transplant? Um, sort of going for, you know, over, over the long term. Right. I don't think, you know, I think the demand is always going to be there and demand is going to be always, uh, you know, much, much, much greater than, uh, than the number of hearts or donors that are available. I think the new allocation does a much better job of giving the organs to the patients who are at the greatest need. Um, but, you know, does it really um, lower the number of patients or increase the number of patients on the wait list? Um, I think in the big picture, it may not make a big difference. That being said, as we as we reviewed, the wait list mortality is much, much less in the new allocation. And actually, that's where the biggest impact has been made. The new allocation hasn't really changed the post-transplant survival as much. Post-transplant survival is similar, or in some studies, maybe it's slightly worse. Um, but the biggest impact has been made on uh, time to transplant in sicker patients. They can get to transplant much quicker. And the overall mortality rate has been improved. So patients are less likely to die in the allocation system. Um, but in the big picture, I think the number of patients on the wait list would still be, you know, still be high. I don't think that would necessarily uh, be impacted by the allocation model. Excellent. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Well, if there's no further questions, um, Dr. Chopar, I really want to thank you again for sharing this uh, talk with us. It was um, I, I definitely learned uh, quite a bit, and I'm uh, going to look up your prior papers that I haven't come across yet that you I shared because it seems like there's a lot of lot of interesting uh, reading there that I haven't had a chance to cover yet. So, uh, thank you again so much, and uh, I'm grateful that you took the time to meet with us today. Thank you, Michael. Again, thanks for the invitation. It was great, great to be with you today. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.